think that uh, you know maybe I have uh, a little more than general knowledge and perhaps a little expertise, but certainly not an expert. Um, there's there are researchers and physicians who basically you know spend their whole uh, career studying this and working with this, and so um, I would consider those to be experts, and I would have some knowledge that might be a little bit more than my mom, although my mom is really smart, so she might know more than I do about many things like this. So anyway, so I, I tried to get a, uh, I tried to get a title here that might grab interest, um, and I don't know if it, if it did or not, but we'll try to address things uh, the way I have it. So, um, so is gluten intolerance a fact, a fiction, or a fad? Yes, fact. It is a, it is a fact. Um, is there fiction involved with it? Yes, I'd say yes and no, there's some fiction. Is there some fad associated with it? I'd say yes, there is too, because a lot of companies, as you probably have noticed, have jumped on the gluten-free bandwagon to uh, be able to tout their products. And so, you know, you want to be able to sort out the fact from, from the fiction, and so, I knew that I'd have a mixed audience. Now I have Dr. Morgan, an internal medicine uh, physician. I have uh, Dr. Goldstein, who's a who's a, a accomplished dentist, and a number of different educators. We got we got uh, biochemists up here and, and geneticists. It's so all that put you on the uh, <laughs> genetic ones. I didn't actually. I didn't, I tried to not go so deep. So I, I knew it was a mixed audience. And so I wanted to try to have a little bit of the science, but not, you know, be talking in uh, doctor speak where it might not be as accessible. So, um, and Tanya had thought there'd be more uh, people who are not medical than people who are actually medical. So what would possible different gluten-related conditions be? And why wouldn't that turn off? <laughs> um, celiac disease, which is also called gluten-sensitive enteropathy, or also called non-tropical sprue. So if you hear any of those terms, it's all related to the same thing called celiac disease. And so that is a well-established entity. It's something, though, that, that in times past, you used to think of that in terms of children. There'd be a child, they would be not doing well, you know, bad and bad stools, you know, or not gaining weight, not having their developmental milestones, and you think, you know, that would be one of the things of the differential diagnosis of do they have celiac disease? Now, that has been uh, evolving, and, and clearly it's been defined that there are adults who don't manifest outwardly the, uh, the condition of celiac um, until later on. You know, so they either may have had this for many years, it just what it was kind of a subclinical sort of picture that didn't rise to the threshold. They didn't have some of the typical symptoms of it, or it may be someone who has some a different spectrum of that. But but we do know, and some studies have shown that the incidence of this appears to be increasing. And there's some different theories behind that. There's nothing that is uh, set in stone about you know, why that might be. One of the postulates is, not yet proven, but one of the postulates is that because of the ready availability of wheat in the United States and other places, Europe and that sort of thing, and because of genetic um, engineering that has occurred to increase the wheat protein, that that may have led to increased incidence. But there does appear to be an increased incidence. And one study that was interesting was one that had used uh, pooled blood samples that had been stored in the, um, now I'm forgetting if it was 1950s or 1960s, but they went back and their, and their hypothesis was that there really wasn't a higher incidence, it's just that it's being diagnosed more. But what they found was that in these blood samples compared to blood samples now, that there was actually a four-fold increase of people who had antibodies um, towards some of the things we'll talk about a little bit later. And so it does appear that there is an increase uh, in the incidence. Then, then there, 
there's another entity called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And that has been kind of bantered around in the media now. Does that exist? Does it not exist? And if you, if you were to Google that, you would probably see something like the, that it's a myth, it doesn't exist, and, and, in, and in other places you say it, it, they say it does. It does appear that this is an entity that's a legitimate entity, and the American Gas, uh, Gastroenterological Society acknowledges that and has that in their position paper of guidelines and recommendations that was published in, two, in 2013, that there's a group of people who seem to have many of the symptoms and issues but don't have the typical uh, sequela, sequela meaning the, the conditions that can occur due to uh, gluten sensitivity that other people do. But they have problems, certainly, with wheat and with gluten, and they feel better if they don't, if they don't use it. So that would be non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And then, we, and we won't spend any time on this particularly, then there's what would be a, a wheat allergy, a pure wheat allergy, and that's not really the same thing as, as uh, celiac or gluten sensitivity. That would be somebody who, like, similar to if they eat shellfish or eat peanuts, they eat something that has wheat in it, and they have an anaphylactic reaction, or they have a severe reaction, such as a, a, a hives, rash, swelling, and those sorts of things. And that's a different kind of mechanism than what would be celiac. Does that all make sense so far? About the kind of the three, the kind of the spectrum of what those things could be? Okay, so just kind of basically, what is celiac disease? Celiac disease, or gluten sensitive enteropathy, is an autoimmune digestive disorder that occurs as a reaction to the protein gluten. Now, if we get technical, it's not actually gluten, it's, it's other proteins, but we're gonna call it gluten, and we're gonna lump gliadin and a bunch of other things together, and when I say gluten, and so, that's what it is. So you, it, autoimmune means that the body is, is seeing this as a foreign invader that antibodies must be produced against, and it produces antibodies abnormally that then react with other tissues of the body and cause damage to other tissues of the body. And so that would be what an autoimmune response would be. And so the, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's a number of different things that, that that leads to that in someone who has celiac disease, they will find these as manifestations. An estimated three million Americans have celiac disease, and it's likely that, that there are a number of cases that are undiagnosed. So it's not common, but it's not rare either. Probably they estimate about one in a hundred people, something like that. That actually have um, they have celiac disease. Now, people, uh, it is postulated and not yet proven that there may be about six percent. So, you know, instead of one out of a hundred, about six out of a hundred people who have uh, a, a gluten intolerance of some kind, where they don't feel good or they have other manifestations, but it's not pure celiac disease. So what is gluten? Gluten is a protein that occurs naturally in wheat, rye, and barley, and crossbreeds of these of these different grains. So it's just part of what is in those um, products. And gluten is the thing that gives breads and other grains their shape, their texture. Uh, you know that nice pull. You know you have a pizza and it's that crusty bread that pulls apart and and all that. That's that's because of gluten. And there's really nothing else that substitutes for that. There's nothing else that gives that same kind of texture, um, shape, and elasticity as gluten does. So when, they, when you see gluten-free products, they put things in there to try and make up for the gluten, but it's not quite like gluten, and so you don't have that same kind of texture. What are possible of celiac disease. So if somebody has actually has celiac disease, what might, what might you see? So you might see someone who has malnutrition, and that would be common in children that are diagnosed with uh, celiac disease, but it could also be occurring in adults that are, that are diagnosed with celiac disease. 
you might see vitamin A nutrition and nutrient deficiency disorders, vitamin D, vitamin A, other sorts of vitamins that can be deficient in people who have, um, have celiac disease. Iron deficiency anemia is something that you might see. Diabetes type 1, and we'll talk uh, briefly about that a little bit later, but someone who has diabetes, that could be a result of celiac disease because diabetes type 1, which is what used to be called juvenile diabetes, that where you don't make insulin, that is an autoimmune condition. That's different than the more common, what used to be called adult onset diabetes, which is related to either deficiency or resistance to insulin, but your body actually can make insulin, your body just doesn't respond normally to that. That's type two, that's the more common type. But you, know, you see the, the kids and they're, you know, they, especially like the athletes and they may have type one diabetes, that's an autoimmune condition. And even though they're, it's all has to do with sugar, they're really kind of different conditions. Probably now if they were discovering these two things, they might name them different things, but they named them that, you know, in years past because they, because they all had kind of some of the same uh, issues with sugar. So type one diabetes might occur from celiac disease. Thyroid disorders, including hypothyroidism, because if you're having an autoimmune condition, if your if your body is in this in this immune um, stimulation, <coughs> causing a lot of different antibodies to be formed to different products then it can react to the thyroid. So thyroid uh, disorders, and more con the most common is hypothyroidism, that can occur. Oops, I did it again. Okay, other autoimmune conditions can occur. Well, there's a list, but we won't go through all of them. Nervous system disorders, um, it's a little bit more nebulous, but certainly things like depression and other conditions can occur in someone who has celiac disease. And it's thought to be not just the fact that they can't eat bread, but it's more than that. It has, it's related to um, what's going on in the, in the immune system. Liver disease can occur. And then something that's very serious is GI lymphoma and possibly other malignancies. So that's one of the reasons why you, if someone has actually celiac disease, you want to make sure that that diagnosis is made. And that's a little bit different. We'll talk about it in a moment or toward the, the end. It's a little different than someone who may have a, have a gluten sensitivity that may not be at risk for malignancy, but someone who has celiac disease is at risk. So, so just to jump ahead for a second, when someone says, well, I'm not having any symptoms now, I've been on, off of gluten and I'm not having any symptoms, can I eat that again? Or can I eat a little bit? Or, or I know I'll have some GI problems, but if I go ahead and eat it, I, I'm willing to, to put up with that. The, the problem is that they, it can, you know, that repeated exposure can lead them to having something with a GI lymphoma or something like that. So that's what you want to make sure that you avoid and make sure that a patient would not continue on even if they're doing okay with it. And then the other thing is, uh, another thing is a, is a condition, a skin condition called dermatitis herpetiformis. So probably something, it's, it's rare in the general population, but it's not uncommon in someone who has celiac disease. Uh, I have a couple pictures of that. Uh, and I don't know, it doesn't show up so well on this because it's kind of bright, but you can see these little pustule, vesicle sort of things that are, and they call it herpetiformis because it kind of looks like a herpes sort of thing where it's an outbreak of a lot of fluid-filled vesicles. And so, and this is another picture of it on the buttocks. And so this is something that is um, severely, it can be debilitating to people in, until they have a diagnosis because it is extraordinarily itchy. I can tell you personally, it is extraordinarily itchy. And, and um, I remember reading in one of the clinical clinic proceedings of, of the Mayo Clinic um, that there was a little line in there when they were talking about it. And, they, and it said, some, some patients have resorted to suicide due to the itching. I mean, it's that itchy. It's like having a mosquito bite and a chicken bite with a sunburn on top of it. And it, and it takes like three or three weeks or so to, for it to resolve. It's really bad. You know, and it doesn't really respond to a lot of other things. 
although it does respond to one drug called Dalsum. We won't go into that, that's a little bit more detail than we want to get, get into, but it is responsive to Dalsum. Okay, so who should be tested for celiac disease? If, if, if a patient or if a person has symptoms, signs, so symptoms would be something that you feel, a sign is something that they seen objectively, like der dermatitis repetiformis, you have a sign. You, there's a rash that is somewhat typical of that. It can be other things, but it's a rash. Or if you have lab evidence pointing to this condition, you know, then you would want to look at, is that a possibility in somebody? And so, you know, the, the things, if someone has these symptoms, malabsorption, chronic diarrhea, gallery, or sciatoria means fatty stools, greasy, floaty, icky, stinky stools. Then, then is, that good, is that a good characteristic? <laughs> is that a good characteristic of that, right? And you don't like to be around someone who has them. Let me tell you. Um, uh, Postprandial abdominal pain. Postprandial means after you eat, you have abdominal pain, then that you know, could indicate that the person has an issue, you know, has celiac disease. That's a possibility. Especially if it doesn't resolve. You know, it's something acute, it happens, it goes away. Well, it's something, but if it goes on and on and you, and you try different things, you probably should be, someone would be likely to be tested for celiac disease. Okay. In pa patients with a first degree relative that has a confirmed diagnosis that meets that criteria, you know, above that we talked about, um, lab, lab abnormalities or signs or symptoms, then it would be potentially reasonable then to, and it's actually recommended to test that person. Then this is a little less of an of a agreement as far as a recommendation, but you could certainly consider testing in somebody who's asymptomatic but has a first degree relative that has a definitively diagnosed uh, case of celiac because they may not be symptomatic at this point, but they may be having some of the immune destruction and intestinal destruction that can be prevented with them continuing on. So again, not as strong of a recommendation as the one above it, but something to consider in certain patients. And then, you know, as I mentioned above, if somebody you know, if someone doesn't have those symptoms, but they have certain lab abnormalities, that when you have an elevation of certain transaminases, which can occur with many things, but that might be something that you would consider. And especially if there's other reasons to believe they might have celiac, then you might go ahead and test them for celiac disease. And then another, this is, again, I even make a softer recommendation, but is something to consider in someone who has uh, type 1 diabetes if they have the, the other symptoms along with that. Okay, is that, is there questions on that information so far? Does that make sense? Is it kind of making sense about what, where we're going? Okay. So how is celiac disease diagnosed? Now, it's a complicated, it, it's a kind of a complicated process. There's algorithms, there's lots of different things but I'll give you kind of the highlights about it, okay? So celiac disease is detected by serological testing. Serological testing means a blood test is drawn and you then spin it down, you get the serum, and then you test for certain things in the blood. And you're looking for celiac-specific antibodies, celiac disease-specific antibodies. So, the, so there's some different ones, but the, and I'll, I'll just scroll through them here. There's some different ones, there's some different ways those tests can be applied, there's different scenarios, it's way more than we want to discuss in this. If it was the medical students and we were talking about celiac diagnosis, I'd torture them with lots of information. But, 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 you know, but just to let you know, the bottom line is serologic tests, a blood test is drawn, they test it for antibodies that your body is making against the proteins related to gluten. So these are some of the things that, that are um, done. And so originally the first two were kind of the standby, now the newer one, um, the, D, the DGP is also used. They're deciding how to use it best. And there's, like I said, there's like whole algorithm trees of, you know, if this, then this, and this, and this. And there's lots of different subtleties within that. Then if you 
have a positive test, the next step in making the diagnosis is to have an endoscopy where they go down, you know, in your throat with a little tube, has a camera, and they biopsy your duodenum. So part of your small bowel, the first part of your small bowel, and they biopsy it. And they may take more than one biopsy because it can be kind of spotty. But they're looking for changes in the lining of the small intestine. So the small intestine is lined with these little finger-like projections, tiny, tiny, that are called villi. And the villi stick into the intestine and they increase the surface area dramatically because instead of it just being a tube that's like this, it's a tube that's like this, with you know tiny, tiny little projections like that. And so when you look at that whole tube, there's a lot of surface area that you wouldn't necessarily see if you just you know opened up with it with the naked eye, you wouldn't realize. That's how things are absorbed. That increases the surface area so things can be absorbed. And so what happens is they look for flattening and destruction of those villi of the small intestine. And so that helps you then make that diagnosis about whether or not um, the person has celiac disease. Okay, and the other thing is the testing has to be done when someone is eating a gluten-containing diet. And so you can't, just, so let's say someone says, I, want to, I saw on Dr. Oz or whatever, and I shouldn't eat gluten or whatever it might be. So they think, oh, I'm gonna go on a gluten-free diet. So they're on a gluten-free diet for a few weeks. It can be as little as two weeks, but let's say two, three, four weeks, whatever it is. Then they go, they, you know, they have their doctor's appointment. Oh, I have, you know, this situation. I think I have gluten, I have celiac. Um, you know, can you test me? Well, the first thing the doctor should ask is, are you on a gluten-free diet? Because if the patient says yes, then you need to put them back on a gluten-containing diet so that, so that, and have them on there for, you know, a minimum of two weeks, but for, for a few weeks, so that then you can be tested. Because otherwise what might happen is if you're on a gluten-free diet, you have celiac, the intestinal stuff might get better and go away, and you may not catch it on the endoscopy. The blood test may very well have gone to normal. You won't have those antibodies floating around, and so it will be a false negative test. So even though you have it, it's a false negative test because of what's going on. You have, you're not using gluten. So you have to do that. Um, in some cases, uh, let's say, for instance, somebody doesn't have the, the typical picture um, then there's reasons in some cases why you might do some genetic testing um, for that. Because there's certain kinds of genetic profiles, um, so the H what they call HLA um, profiles, that indicate, have a much stronger prevalence of people with gluten-sensitive uh, enteropathy, celiac disease, than, than uh, the normal population. It doesn't mean, you know, it's not used for screening because you can have those genetic uh, you could have those uh, genetic findings and not have celiac. And so it's not done that way, but it can be done as part of the whole workup. Tanya? Do you know if there's any um, cultural um, positive or more like when I was in Europe, so my grandma was really versus other uh, populations, Asian and everything. And when they've tried to, when they looked at that, there's more of the information, and I didn't go deep into that, but what I do know is when they looked into it to say, okay, now you have Asian population that's using a higher wheat containing diet, do they have an increase? It's, it's, no, there's no definitive answer to that. So it may, it's probably the genetic uh, disposition. Here's our geneticist to tell me something different. Or, I, or hopefully confirm what I say. Then they actually have a, a, another question. Oh, another question. Oh, no. <laughs> um, go ahead. Is there a correlation between gluten sensitivity 
disease diagnosis and um, insensitivity, or I'm sorry, insensitivity to other proteins such as the casein in milk or soy or some of these, these other protein intolerances. I, I, I didn't see any studies that show when someone has celiac, I haven't seen any studies that uh, show that they have a higher incidence of them having other allergies, although they may have a sensitivity. Now the thing is, uh, and Dr. Morgan, you're, you know, Dr. Morgan and Glaser, you're free to, to say, oh, you've seen something different, and that'd be fine with you. Um, but what, what has been shown is if somebody has celiac disease, and they have biopsy-proven, you know, a, a small intestine, dis you know, a disruption and destruction, et cetera, then it's recommended that during that time of healing, a number of weeks or even months, they should, they should either avoid or use something that would help them digest milk products because they're harder to digest anyway. So they may show a, a sensitivity to milk products during that time, but when it's all healed up, then they might not be sensitive. So, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're sensitive to both, it means that you're not digesting it well because you have some intestinal destruction. And so that would have to be kind of sorted out. So after they were off, so the recommendation is to have people off and then, you know, then introduce milk products slowly when it's felt that it's healed. And, and you know, it, sometimes, especially in a university study center, they might do serial biopsies, but most people are just loath to have that done <laughs> unless they really need to have it done. Uh, and, and once you've had it done once, most people don't crave to ever have it done again unless they absolutely have to. So, so you know, you don't necessarily know, but you kind of give a guess. You know, does, it, does that make sense? Okay. Um, now, what is non-celiac disease? Is that non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Actually, we have some time here. Although controversy in the past, as I said, this condition has gained acceptance. Patients have some of the symptoms of celiac, but they don't have the usual diagnostic laboratory findings or the biopsy findings. And the symptoms that they are having, you know, the GI symptoms are might be, they don't know for sure, but they might be due to other wheat, wheat or grain proteins or carbohydrates that are causing these issues and it's not gluten per se, that they still have symptoms that resemble that. Um, overall, there's no evidence that someone who has a gluten intolerance, but yet doesn't have actual celiac, has the sequela and consequences that, you know, that gluten um, uh, celiac disease can have, such as the Lyme disease and other conditions. And so somebody who had you know, if it was known for sure they didn't have celiac disease and they wanted to have the occasional something, then, um, you know, it's probably no harm done other than the fact that they might, you know, have a little bit of misery afterward for a day or two, but it's not going to have any long-term sequela. And that's what, that's the best information we have at this point in time as it's being looked at. <clears throat> okay, is there a pill I can take so I can eat bread? Like lactic, like lactase from milk. I don't know. <laughs> so I have celiac. I would, because I mean there are days I could kill for a croissant, but I won't. Um, but anyway, but there isn't. No, there's nothing like that. And um, you certainly don't want to do things that would that would suppress your immune system to the point of not creating antibodies, because that can uh, lead you to all other sorts of issues. So. So, uh, you know, at this point, you know, nothing exists. They are looking for something, but there's no magic pill. So what's the treatment for celiac disease? Gluten-free diet. And, and if someone's, you know, if someone is diagnosed with celiac disease, then, you know, it, it's very reasonable to have that person see a dietitian and, and, and have a dietitian that is familiar with, you know, um, you know, foods that would be good, healthy, et cetera, for um, someone who has celiac disease. You need to avoid wheat, rye, barley, and possibly oats. So some people, some people who have celiac are sensitive to oats, even if they're gluten-free oats, and it's recommended to keep the, the, um, the, the level of what you eat of oats 
lower than you know, but, but the, I think the recommendation is like a quarter cup a day. That's a lot of oats. So, so for most people, that's okay. But, but if you're going to eat some oats, um, then you'd want to have something that would be sort of like gluten-free oats. And, and I, I don't know if it's w well elucidated, but the things that I have heard, certainly cross-contamination can occur. So processing, you know, a plant that processes wheat and they process oats, that can occur. But there's also some evidence that I don't know is hard fact, but it's some evidence that when oats are grown in a field that have wheat, that they might pick up some of the protein. That's been postulated. And then certainly, even when they're being harvested, even if they're being processed somewhere else, you know, the harvesting machine and everything might have some residue from wheat. So anyway, so that's why people who uh, have celiac would want to use a certified gluten-free oat. Okay, and then we also want to do some testing for vitamin deficiencies and possible vitamin mineral replacement and supplementation. And, um, and then depending on uh, a number of factors, you might consider doing a, a, a scan for bone loss because someone that has uh, celiac disease can have uh, osteoporosis, low bone density, that sort of thing. So how do I know that a food item is gluten-free? First thing is you read the label. Now, the good news is, unlike 10 years ago, the good news is that now, as of, I probably have it here, um, August uh, 2014, the FDA has really cracked down on the regulation of, if you put gluten-free, it has to mean certain things, because before it's kind of a, a, a gluten-free for all about what that actually meant. But the thing is, the label is, the labeling is voluntary, so you don't have to put gluten-free on it. But if you put gluten-free, if you see an item that's gluten-free, then it is, it is, as of August 2014, supposed to conform to, to this. So basically, it standardized those requirements in the meaning of gluten-free. And in order for a product to be labeled gluten-free, it must contain less than 20 parts per million of gluten. And so that means that they, in before they can do it. Now they, so if they don't put that on there, it may be totally gluten free. You may have a thing of rice that's processed in a plant that only processes rice for the last 100 years, and it's as gluten free as it comes, but they don't have to label that. But if they do label it gluten free, it has to conform to the FDA labeling. And um, so as products, get sold and every time there may be some residual things, it would apply to all the product, product, products. The other thing is, if it's an imported product, it's supposed to be labeled according to US standards. And so it should be labeled gluten-free or whatever it would be labeled. Um, if you buy it at some shady roadside thing, you don't know. <laughs> but if it's in a grocery store or something, then it should be. And, and, the, and the label requirements would include all things that are regulated by the FDA, packaged foods, supplements, that sort of thing, but not things that fall under the um, tobacco and firearms department. You know, that, that would have to be labeled gluten-free according to these regulations. Do they have to actually test their food to prove to the FDA that they have a specific EGPM? At, at some juncture, they have to, now, they have to have evidence that it's less than 20 parts per million, so there have to be some kind of testing. Look, I got tired of seeing the gluten-free labels on things in the store that had absolutely nothing to do with gluten whatsoever. Like, you could pick up a package of, I don't know, grapes or something, and it would say, gluten-free grapes. That's the part <laughs> that's the bad part, <laughs> right? Because, you know, you talk about the gluten-free, you go to Sprouts, and like every label, every other label, but you know, there's some things that would potentially be inherently gluten-free. Um, you know, lentil chips that have nothing in them besides lentils and salt and whatever, but they're processed in a plant with wheat. So they may not be labeled gluten-free because actually there may be some contamination. And when they do the study, they show that, uh, I think it was 33 products or whatever, that like 35% of them actually had you know, way more than 20 parts per million. Some of them had up to 2,900 parts of per million, um, you know, that, that were actually inherently gluten-free products, 
but they weren't gluten free because of cross contamination. Okay, so here we go, gluten free. And so that's a, that's a, a you know, label you'll see a lot. And, and then there's also certified gluten free. Now certified gluten free, theoretically, now with the new FDA labeling guidelines, may not mean as much except for when it's certified gluten free, Generally, what that implies is that there was no gluten detected, meaning it's less than five parts per million. And so, if, so that would be something that we, you know, if someone's very sensitive, that might even be a little safer than just the, the gluten-free. That's kind of in flux now, because like I said, August 2014 was the new regulation. This is all pretty new. Okay, is a food item healthier if it's gluten-free? That's the question people ask. But somebody, oh, for my health, I'm gonna go gluten-free. Maybe, maybe not. So let me give you my top five lists of gluten-free products that that uh, that I find to be essential, and you decide if they're healthy or not. Okay, coffee, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> now the problem is, though, you have to watch the labeling. Is chocolate is inherently gluten-free, but processing might not be. So Godiva, doggone them, you can't eat Godiva chocolate because it has stuff in it that, you know, most of the things are going to label, say, processed in a plant with weed or whatever, you know, so there's a lot of things you have to watch for, like Trader Joe's hummus, which I used to love, and it was plenty cheap, Trader Joe's processed in a plant with weed. It's a no-go, you know, I, I kept on going, why am I getting sick every time I eat Trader Joe's hummus? Well, that was why. Um, potato chips, gluten-free, on my list of essential. <laughs> <laughs> now my grandmother's, my grandmother's top four food groups, she lived to be 98, were coffee, potato chips, bacon, and pie. So sadly I can't have the pie on my list. But I, <laughs> so, 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 and, 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 and distilled spirits, are gluten-free if there's nothing added to them. So, you know, vodka, which I don't particularly like, but vodka um, is gluten-free, but raspberry flavored vodka may not be gluten-free because it was raspberry syrup that was put into it or something like that. Beer and those sorts of things are not gluten-free. There's a few gluten-free beers, and I never liked beer that much anyway, so I haven't even tried them, but beer's kind of nasty anyway, so. Um, <laughs> in my opinion. So, but that's something you could not have because the malted barley is involved with, with um, beer. So, um, wine is okay. Okay, now that doesn't show very well. It shows up better on my computer screen. But then that's to answer the question about is it more healthy? Well, a lot of times in the gluten-free stuff when you look, there's a laundry list of stuff that's going into it to make it kind of hold together like a cracker that, you know, you, you might have a nice natural wheat cracker that might be, you know, wheat, um, you know, wheat, oil, salt, and some kind of leavening agent, and that's all. But here we have, you know, brown rice flour, you can't read it all, but corn flour, gluten-free oats, potato starch, potato flakes, high oleic, oleic sunflower oil, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and it's a whole list of stuff that to, to make it kind of like a regular cracker. And so it may or may not be more healthy. And a lot of times there's an increased amount of fat and other things in gluten-free products, so you have to be careful how you use them. So just because it's gluten-free doesn't by default mean it's uh, healthy, um, but it may be. Good. Yes, Cindy. The whey protein, is whey okay? Uh, whey is okay, it's a dairy product. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean it's fine if, for someone who's not as sensitive also to dairy products. So what common foods are gluten free? There's a whole there's a whole list of things, but I gave, you know, I guess I just did as many as the slide would hold. Uh, basically eggs, dairy products, rice, corn, millet, quinoa, buckwheat, even though it says wheat, it's it's different. Um, fruits, vegetables, there's lots and lots of things that are gluten-free inherently. And if nothing's added to them, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. But there can be hidden gluten and stuff that you might not think. So you think, oh, I'm gonna have some Chinese food 
and they're using rice noodles and vegetables and it's all good, but the soy sauce, one of the first ingredients on regular old soy sauce is wheat. Actually, actually higher on the list than soy. So, so you'd have to have something that's a soy sauce made with soy only, like tamari, instead of soy sauce. That's something you might not think about, but that could be a problem. You might have a situation where you have items fried in oil that's used for food but wheat. So maybe, you know, so, so corn tortilla chips aren't, aren't a, you know, don't have gluten in them, but they may have picked up some gluten in the frying process if, if there's, you know, contamination between, and you can read other stuff. But there's things that you may not think about, processed lunch meat, self-made poultry, communion wafers, you know. Um, when I go to church, my pastor makes some special bread for me. Aww. He does, he's good. Or, or he serves everybody just rice crackers or something. So, you know, I think that's cool. Um, uh, herbal supplements, and then certain craft supplies. And that's especially important with kids because the kid that has celiac, they may use Play-Doh or crayons or some other things like that that may have wheat in them as part of a binder. And then they either put that thing in their mouth. I mean, how many of us ate Play-Doh? I didn't. But I know a lot of people that did. Yes, there we go. There's only one person who's honest. The rest of us are, the rest of us are in denial. Um, and you know, and then they either put it in their mouth or they may, you know, handle these things and then eat without washing their hands, even if you send them to wash their hands, you know how that goes. And so then they might get contamination and be sick from it. Okay, how about eating out? Well, that can be a problem. You gotta be careful. So as we talked about, cross-contamination can be an issue. So for instance, I don't take a chance on Paradise Bakery because after getting sick like four times, you know, it's just, there's just too much wheat flour, I think, floating around in the air. And, and maybe they cut their salad on the same cutting board that they cut their, their bread or whatever it is. It just, it, it doesn't work out. And so, so you have to be careful about things like that. So someone may say, you know, on the menu it may say no gluten or whatever, or you, you may ask for a recommendation, but you gotta still be careful because they're not thinking about the, you know, the minor stuff. The other thing is they may not think about things that might be thickening agents. And, and there can be, you can have a salad, but there might be some wheat to thicken it up in the salad dressing, depending on the salad dressing. So you have to think about those things. So these are my top uh, choices of places to go. And so Chipotle is good because it only, the only thing I believe that, that and I haven't, I didn't check on the sofritas because I've had enough tofu to float a boat. Um, so I, I don't eat the tofu, but, and I don't think it has any gluten. But the only thing that they have on their menu that I'm aware of is the, the burrito, the, the, the flour tortilla. But otherwise, everything that they have is, is gluten-free. It's, it's just, and it's prepared gluten-free. And so it's a, it's a safe place. A lot of people that have celiac will, will go there. Yeah, Chang's is interesting. And I think that must, someone on the board must, of directors or something must have had celiac because for, for years, before even this was even talked about particularly, they had a gluten-free menu, and they actually have a, a dedicated walk for the gluten-free items on their menu, and they have special plates and everything else. I mean, they really have a, I think they're rated the number two on the most gluten-friendly restaurant or something like that. But anyway, but they have that, and you can be really assured that that's you know, gonna be okay. And Hayway is a subs subsidy of, uh, of Kip Chang's, and they have a gluten-free menu, and it doesn't seem to be an issue there either. So I haven't had any, any mishap. But other places, for instance, I love to go to the little cafe, I, I, I would love to go to the little cafe where I live called Divine, and it's delicious, and their food is great, and they even say they're you know, gluten-free or whatever, but I think because their kitchen is so small that there's cross so I got sick every time, so now I just go there to dine. <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive. Okay, so summary. I don't know what happened, drag below. So let's start with the one that's supposed to be on top. Celiac disease um, can cause a range, so summary. Range of symptoms from mild to severe in people in the condition. 
Once thought to be a disease of children, celiac disease can develop to the lifespan. The incidence of celiac disease appears to be increasing. The next item that I don't know why it's staying below is celiac disease can be diagnosed with blood tests and a small intestine biopsy, but you must be eating gluten when you're doing it. Genetic testing might help if there's atypical results or, and this is something that has to be negotiated with the patient, but you have someone, if everything points to it, and they just refuse to go back on the gluten. Because, you know, because they just say, I'm not gonna do a gluten challenge, you might do genetic testing on that, okay, just to see if there's something else going on. That's a difficult decision. Genetic testing may also point towards celiac disease in, per in persons on a gluten-free diet. Oh, I already said that. Who refused the gluten challenge? I anticipated myself. <laughs> People with celiac disease should avoid gluten because of the risk of cancer nutritional deficiency and additional autoimmune disorders. So like I said, even if you say, oh, I can tough it out, you know, I'd rather have that croissant or that pizza and suffer for, you know, a few couple days or so, it's not worth it because of the, the consequences down the road. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is recognized by a gastroenterologist, but it's not well understood and, you know, and that it is considered a, a legitimate entity. Proper diagnosis of celiac versus non-celiac is important, as I said, because of the consequences of gluten exposure in celiac. Many foods that are inherently gluten-free may have additives or cross-contamination containing gluten, and gluten-free foods are not necessarily healthier due to higher fat content, other additives, other additives, additives that might be added to make them more palatable. I think that's it. So, any, that's a lot, but any questions? Yes? So, would someone start out with celiac and then it's not yet diagnosed until later, or could someone not have it and then develop it over years of eating? Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, so the thing is, I guess, technically, Somebody may have celiac, but it would be subclinical celiac. So you actually have the setup for it, and it may be, because you see, the whole thing is potentially an interaction between uh, genetics and environment. And so when they did studies with twins, and there's limited numbers they can use, so they, you know, but by and large, even ones that were in different environments, all have celiac, but not 100% concordant. So out of the, I think there was six twin, uh, twin groups that were studied, you know, six pairs of twins were studied. I think uh, there was concordance in the five of those six, but there was one that, one had celiac and one didn't, and they had been in a different environment. So it, it can be a constellation of things. So a person may have that predisposition, and perhaps if you were raised in a very weak, poor environment, then you might not have full manifestations of that. But here in the United States, you know, there's a lot, especially if someone's vegetarian or something like that, then you're going to have a lot of exposure to that. And that leads me to the next question, which you might, there might not be an answer, but could someone not be genetically predisposed yet eat way too much, like overeat meat all their lifetime and then... And have, a, have an issue with it. Um, that's a, the, so the question was if you, you know, maybe not genetically predisposed, but you have a lot of wheat and you become sensitive to it. Chances are that could be the situation, and I'm, I'm kind of guessing on that one because I don't know if I have an answer. And anyone can chime in if they have it. But I would say that that might be something more related to the non-celiac gluten intolerance or, or wheat intolerance versus the actual celiac. Now, do 100% of people who have celiac have that genetic, those particular common genetic findings? No, 100% don't have. But could there be other minor genetic findings that work together to make someone have celiac? Yes, they could. So, so the thing is, probably celiac is more on the genetic side, and the other may be related to the other. That's basically just a theory, 
and no one is chiming in at this point in time. And so, but I think that's an excellent question, but I think that that is um, probably what, what we know at this point. Any idea what the genetic test cost? Uh, idea. You know, I didn't look it up uh, lately, um, and I didn't have to look it up because it was I was just curious. Yes, yes. Um, I'd never but, heard them, but, so I have no um, idea. I don't know. Do you have to know Dr. Cross? Um, it depends on if it's based on a clinical presentation or if the patient goes, just goes, hey, I'm convinced that I absolutely have to use. Please test me. Yeah, um, if you shot them, it's one thing. But if yeah. you're saying you're trying to rule out celiac and you're doing a genetic test of the HLA, I think it's what, 8 and 4, B8, 4. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that one. Yeah. Remember, gen insurance companies are getting much better now about covering genetic tests. Um, when patients present with the proper signs and symptoms. Um, without them, they're saying no, because they don't want to test or touch the whole, you know, who owns genetic information, et cetera. I think it's, my guess is based on other things, it's probably a, a couple hundred dollars or several hundred dollars, it's not thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. I was concerned right. it could be a couple yeah, of it's, it, you know, I mean, Unlike even 10 years ago, you know, when genetic testing was extraordinarily expensive and inaccessible, now there's a lot more ability to do it for a cheaper price. We paid, I think it was $225 for a test for my daughter for a couple little things. So it'd probably be equivalent if you look at it on pocket. Right. Yeah, so something like that. And, and celiac, we're talking about celiac in kids. I kind of gave an overview of just celiac and I probably tended more toward the adult side, but celiac in kids, there's there's different ways that you diagnose. You use different kinds of the serologic tests. You need to be uh, greater than two years old to use some of those tests. You have if you're under two, there's another different testing algorithm. That's a little bit beyond what we wanted to talk about here. So yes, kind of associate with that with the whole theory about the the leaky gut with children under two. Can a child under two manifest a celiac type disease similar as they manifest a milk intolerance that they then kind of grow out of as they mature? Or is that not really seen? I think that I think that the answer to that would be that they may manifest some of the GI symptoms without the intestinal destruction mm -hmm. that they could grow out of. I think that that's probably the, the best answer on that. And so that's a possibility, but that would be more like the, the you know, gluten sensitivity sort of thing versus actually having celiac. Mm -hmm. if, if you have actually celiac, then I don't think there's any reversal of it. And even if you go off gluten for years, when people have been re-challenged with gluten, everything starts cramping. Well, I know you guys all have something else at one o'clock, so um, you, you, anyone's always free to ask me other questions. I'm happy to answer what I know or. <laughs>